Hello everybody, welcome back to our Norman vs. Mongol podcast, and today we're going to be discussing Norman armor versus Mongol armor. If that's not interesting, let's hop into it. Now before we begin, I release a new video on my Norman vs. Mongol podcast every Wednesday. We are also going to start doing some other uh, videos on this channel, researching other characters from history during the Norman Plantagenet era, and not just in Europe. We're also going to be looking at uh, other warriors who are uh, extremely underrated and in my in uh, my opinion underappreciated when talked about during research so comment down below uh, any race of people or any uh, warrior culture that you think is underrated between you know 1100 or 1000 to 1500 and uh, if you would like to see a video on them uh, just comment down below let me know also let me know who do you think will win this matchup do you think the Normans would win or do you think the Mongols would win uh, stay tuned for more subscribe turn on notifications and uh, enjoy now, um, armor worn by the Normans during the 11th century was uh, actually uh, rather simple and pretty easy to break down. First, you would have your padded gambeson on underneath your armor, and over that you would put on a coat of mail. Now, most coats of mail during this period weighed about 60 pounds, and the Normans had been uh, very well trained in wearing them from a very young age. So they were very used to it by this point. So, like I said, you would have your gambeson on the bottom. You would have your mail over that. And then you would put on your belt. And the belt was not just to hold your uh, sword onto your body. You would actually put on the belt uh, very tightly to help take off some of the weight of that heavy mail shirt on your shoulders. Now, I also wanted to point out that during this period, the uh, mail worn by the Normans, in most cases, you know, if you could afford to, you, you would wear the uh, mail down past your... Uh, arms, but in most cases, the uh, mail would stop right about here, come past the elbows and cover it up. Uh, you could wear uh, bands for this, for protection. This is one of the few times you, they probably did wear leather bands. I know people see a lot of leather armor on that's not done properly and complain about it, and that's true. Um, but uh, that was the more so common Norman armor. There are also cases where the Normans were wearing scale armor, much like the scale armor worn by the Byzantines. And this would make sense since most Normans during this era had uh, traveled to uh, Sicily and the Byzantine Empire and served as mercenaries. And if you see somebody wearing superior armor and you're getting paid well enough and you can afford it, well then you would obviously adapt your armor to wear it. Now, there's this myth that I'm pretty sure by now enough historians have debunked it already, so I don't need to go deep into detail, but chain mail is not easily pierced. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're, we should all understand that by now. And Gamison itself is also not easily pierced. It actually defends pretty well against sword slashes. Uh, it does indeed take damage. It does get cut, but it protects the wearer very well. So, you had your padded Gamison, which is pretty good defense against slashing up from swords and arrows. And then over that, you had your riveted chainmail. You know, you didn't wear butted chainmail during this era. They had riveted chainmail, which is actually very good defense against axes, against arrows, against swords, thrusting, as well as slashing. You know, it's not easily destroyed. If it was so easily destroyed as it is often portrayed in movies, uh, nobody would have worn it. It would have been pretty much useless. Now, there are certain ways to pierce it. You know, there are special thrusts. I think Thran did a video showing where you could pierce riveted chainmail uh, pretty effectively. But not only did they have the chainmail and the gamison, they also had their kite-shaped shield, which we know, we know was designed to protect the, uh, the reason it comes down to that point is because it's protecting your leg while you're on horseback. And if you have a round shield, well, it can't go past the uh, saddle of your horse and be very good at protecting you. And with that point, it's able to come down and cover the leg and guard it very well. Now, on the Mongol side, you actually had something kind of similar to it. Now, mail was indeed worn by the Mongols. It was just very rare due to the fact that uh, mail, if damaged, it takes a long time to repair and you need special shops and people who are very well crafted in it. And I'm not saying that the uh, Mongols lacked the ability to uh, craft that very well. They did make uh, metal weapons. They had uh, shekel armor as well. But it's, uh, it's a very tedious task and Though they're a nomadic lifestyle, it didn't fit with their nomadic lifestyle. So they didn't wear whale that, wear mail that often. Uh, more so common during this period, and that was worn up even to the 1800s, would be leather armor. Yes, good leather armor. Not the uh, soft scale armor that we see so often portrayed in movies. Now, you would have your leather armor on, which is good defense against slashing weapons. And also underneath that, they would have a silk shirt on. Now, there was one account that said if you shot an arrow at a Mongol while he was running at you, it would stick at him and he would keep on coming. And a test done by historians shows that while you could pierce leather armor by itself 
with the bow and arrow. The silk shirt behind the leather, the arrow will go through the leather, but it won't pierce the silk. It will actually wrap around it if it goes into the flesh, rather than having to uh, break the arrow and pull it out of your body or push the arrow through your injured body part, whether it's your, you know, your torso or your limb, uh, you could just s unfold the silk shirt nice and smooth, and this prevents greater damage from happening to the body. So, uh, which one do I think is better? I think I would have to give the uh, edge to the Normans in this case, simply because chainmail is uh, very effective at stopping most of the weapons using that era. That's why it was, you know, used for such a long time. Uh, and also against the uh, weapons the Mongols would be using. The bow and arrow. Yes, there are accounts where uh, the bow and arrow would pierce the chainmail, but like I said, they don't only have the chainmail. They have their shield on, they have the chainmail, and they have the gamut underneath. Gamut also is very good at protecting against uh, uh, bladed weapons as well. Also, I think that the... Uh, The uh, lance used by the uh, Normans would be very effective. I know I'm not comparing weapons yet, but just for, if we look at it in general. Uh, Gambeson, if we compare Gambeson just to the leather. Gambeson is easier to repair than leather. If your leather gets cut open or split open, you can't just stitch it back together like you can Gambeson. Also, you can get Gambeson in much more abundance since it uh, comes from a plant that you uh, can grow and weave it into those protective fibers. And then for the chainmail, yes, while the chainmail is much harder to repair, uh, remember we are comparing the Normans under the Tancred sons, and uh, they can certainly afford to do so. They can afford to repair their mail. That's why they, you know, had it. It was in large abundance among their men. So you know, just at first glance, I, I would give you know an extremely large edge to the uh, armor worn by the Normans. And, uh, but, you know, there's a reason that the, that the Mongols didn't wear a lot of heavy armor, and that's because they wanted to be swift. And I pointed this out in my uh, previous video, there were separate contingents of cavalry used by the Mongols. You would have the light cavalry, and you also had the heavy cavalry, which Genghis Khan uh, developed later on in the period. Now, the armor worn by them was the, uh, would be the scale armor. Now, this usually weighed about 45 to 55 pounds, you know, especially if, depending upon the guy wearing it, because you could have a really big Mongol wearing it, or you could have a smaller guy wearing it. But this was worn by, only by the elite cavalry, so, you know, not the, majority of the ar not the majority of the army would be wearing this armor. This armor is actually a very, very defensive, very good defense against cutting, slashing, and thrusting weapons. Uh, it's not easily pierced. Like I said before, you know, movies often portray armor being pierced very easily. If it was so easy to pierce armor... Nobody would wear it. So, in that instance, I would say that armor might be a little bit more defensive than the uh, scale armor, sorry, than the um, male armor worn by the Normans. But Normans also had scale armor, and I would venture to say that the Byzantine scale armor was just as defensive as the armor worn by the Mongols, because the steels made around the time, both countries can afford to get the best steel. The Byzantines could, and Normans could afford to get the best deal, and the uh, Mongols could certainly afford to, especially after Genghis Khan had uh, conquered and united the tribes around him, afford the best deal. So in that in that case, I'd say that the armors would be pretty much even. Uh, and they covered around, they covered the same amount of the body. The Mongol scale armor would come down to the knees. The uh, Byzantine, which the Normans would wear also, scale armor would come down to the knees. And uh, like I said, especially depending upon the weapons they're fighting against, how effective would the armor be? So in that instance, I'd say for the leather with the silk against the uh, male with the gambeson, I'd rather be wearing the, Mon the Norman armor. And when it comes to the scale armor between the two sides, I'd say it's pretty much even. And I don't think that the amount is going to make a huge difference because like I said, not every Norman wore the scale armor. It would, the majority of them would be wearing the male armor, but it's the same for the Mongols. Not every Mongol wore the scale armor either. The majority of them would be wearing the leather and the silk shirts. So in that case, I'd say we have a slight edge to the Normans for the armor because the gambeson and the male is more effective at protecting you than the leather and the silk shirt.